Everybody be tall. We're live. Good evening. Welcome to People's University Ancient History. Thanks for coming out tonight. Good to see so many of you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind turning your cell phone off at this point. If you're not on our mailing list but would like to be, the box is over there. The brochures are on the tables or on the column there if you want to know what upcoming classes will entail. This Tuesday, Disturbance at Chaplain Street, it's a panel discussion featuring five eyewitnesses of an event that happened 50 years ago. And um, it's a part of our exhibit upstairs, and this t-shirt is as well. Next Thursday, on the 26th at 7 p.m., uh, Nikki, can I go in? Yeah. <laughs> Nikki will be back to talk about Greece Part 2, Archaic and Classical. Now remember, if you sign in here, you'll be in the running to attend the Carnegie uh, Walton Hall of Ancient Egypt tour with us on March 2nd at 6 p.m. We can take 20 people, and we'll have to work that out. However, but make sure you sign in to be eligible. The people who come to every class get priority. Okay, our instructor tonight is Dr. Marie N. Perasia. Did I say that right? Yeah, you nailed it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't always get it right. Uh, her students call her Doc, so I'm assuming we can call her Doc. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is a Bronze Age Aegean archaeologist and art historian who focuses on iconography, exchange, and identity in prehistoric Afro Eurasia. She current, that's very impressive, isn't it? She currently works as an assistant professor of classical archaeology and religious studies at Marshall University and as a consulting scholar for the University of Pennsylvania. Some of her most recent work has been featured in Smithsonian Magazine and her up and coming projects on the interconnectivity in the Neolithic and Bronze Age periods were hosted by the University of Oxford in early December 2022. Here she is, Doc. I am so excited to be with you tonight. So first of all, I have to warn you, I talk with my hands. So if this gets in the way or if I move <laughs> around a little bit too much and I'm not tracking on the mic, please somebody just give me the like, get back to it, get focused. Um, okay, so I, what do you want to hear tonight? I mean, obviously you're here for the Bronze Age. Are there any themes? Because let's face it, I'm, I'm here for you. Are there any themes you want to make sure we hit on? And I will do my best to make sure we do. I don't know. Destroy the treasure. Oh, we are starting with Troy and the treasure. You are right on. Awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else here for something in particular? I'm interested in bull dancing. Bull dancing. Oh, we will go there. Okay. We will go there and do our best to decode it. But we're honestly, most of us just go, nah, it's ritual. Okay. We'll get there because that's a slippery slope. Hit me, sir. Santorini and the big eruption. Oh, that one's so near and dear to my heart. Okay, you guys are, did you research before you got here? <laughs> did you look up what I do? Because you are all right on the money. All right. Um, oh, that's true. It's in the, it's in the program. Okay. Um, and before, before I forget, you guys already covered Egypt in this lecture series, right? Okay. Where is she? Here we go. Kara Cooney's book, When Women Ruled the World. Do you guys know Kara? Has she, have you ever read some of her other books? She is one of my best friends. If there is ever a woman to be terrified of, it's Kara, because she's so good. Um, she's going to be giving a, she's giving a public lecture through the Archaeological Institute of America earlier, on, earlier in the day on Thursday. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, I'm more than happy to share with the list um, of links to how you can register for that. It's all online, so if you guys want to watch that. Um, I'm happy to clue you in there. She is, like I said, terrifying in a wonderful way. So um, hopefully I can kind of live up to her terrifyingness um, as we get going here. So we'll start with a little talk about this fella. Do any of you recognize, I mean, I know I gave you his name, but do any of you recognize the name Shimon? Yes. Hit me. What do you got? He really believed in Troy and the, that Odyssey or whatever it was. Yeah. He went out and he... <laughs> he, got, he, got, he found the treasure and yeah. he laughed at it. 
It was, it was people, people started by laughing at him. So education back at 1800s, late 1800s, if you were really well educated, what do you do once you finish college? You sit around and retranslate the Iliad and the Odyssey over and over and over. And over. So believe it or not, this is one of the things that became one of his passions or maybe brainwashing. I mean, passions. Um, and so Heinrich, got it in his head that he could identify exactly where Troy was, and he did. But when, when, he, when he found Troy, he wasn't exactly sure. So archaeology back then is a lot different than archaeology today. Good archaeology today means we have a relatively small team of people. So probably somewhere, it maybe doesn't sound small at first, but hear me out. Um, somewhere between maybe 20 and 30 people on a team. We only open a few trenches. I, maybe three or four trenches, so that it's manageable. We can be responsible for all of the material. We have a good number of hands for the thorough documentation of every step. I mean, photos, drawings, extensive notebooks that talk about dirt. Um, <laughs> you, you name it, really. So what Heinrich did, um, Heinrich sort of rolled into Turkey. Um, the site's called Hisarlik. Uh, rolled into Turkey, didn't speak any Turkish. So he married a Turkish woman. Um, the obvious answer. So here's a picture of Sophia, um, and we'll get to what she is wearing in a moment. Um, so here's Sophia. Sophia was both translator and wife, um, coincidentally, and she helped him recruit over 200 local people to dig until they found something cool. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and it, it really was. It was just a digging extravaganza. And so they dug, and they dug, and they dug, and they dug until they got to the point where they found these huge walls. And he said, Troy was huge. These walls can't possibly be the extent of Troy. Keep digging. And then, and, and then all of the big architecture kind of disappeared. And he dug straight through Troy without taking great notes. Um, one of the things that he was successful at um, was reinforcing when the local workmen would bring him gold. That was one word he learned really fast in Turkish. So um, as they would bring him gold, there was not really a lot of documentation of where the gold was. Um, he sort of just started putting it in a pile. I cannot make this up. I wish I were making this up. Just kind of putting it in a pile. Um, and then one day, I mean, after years and years of digging and a oh, little, little publication here, a little publication there, kind of little teasers, um, the Berlin Museum said, listen, buddy, you need to send us some results or we're not going to fund you anymore. We're not going to publish anything you send us. And he said, great. So bring me the gold. They brought him the gold pile. He put it in a corner of architecture, snapped a picture. I wish I had this for you. Um, snapped a picture. And the headlines read that he has discovered Priam's gold. So from the Iliad and the Odyssey, do you remember who King Priam was? Who was, who was Priam? Peter Troy. Excellent, he was the king of Troy. Was he like the new hot guy, or, or was he the one who knew what he was doing? He was the older one, right? So he's, he was the father, he was the one who was in charge, um, and he was getting ready to hand off the kingdom to Hector when all hell broke loose, right? So if this is Priam's treasure, this would be the treasure of an established kingdom. This would be a, a, a treasure that would have existed for a long, 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 long time, um, which may or may not have sort of factored into the way that people regarded this pile of gold. Um, since it was a pile of gold from several different periods, several different styles, really. Um, we have one style seen up here on Sophia. Um, at first, there wasn't a lot of questioning about what was going on until we started to introduce slightly more rigorous methods when it came to archaeology, and people started going, wait a minute, what's he doing? So Heinrich Schliemann sort of talked himself into a corner, especially when he shared these photos. And I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of a subtle slide across the table, oh, look what I found. It was headlines, international headlines about what had been found. How do you think the Turkish felt when they found out? Uh, yeah, not so great, not ideal. Um, so when he was approached about, um, you know, turning, turning in the gold and, and they would museum and there would you know the age of antiquarianism um he said no and he took off and he took the gold with it he left sophia but he took the gold and he went back i know he went back to berlin and 
legend legend goes this one is not written down i have so someone who i worked for when i was in graduate school so that their advisor knew Schliemann very well, and that's where the story comes from. Um, said that when he got back to Berlin, and he ran into his house, literally ran into his house, he was carrying this gold in a paper bag. I can't fact check this for you, I'm sorry. This is, But this is what they say. So uh, in a paper bag, ran into the house, barricaded the house, refused to come out for anyone. The Turkish authorities eventually followed, notifying the German authorities, so the German authorities... Russian, or sorry, the Turkish authorities show up and they said, buddy, you got to hand over the gold. And he said, cool, and threw it out the window. It's still in the bag, at least. Threw it out the window. And because it was one of the German folks who grabbed the bag first, the gold never went back to Turkey. It went right into the Berlin Museum. What happened to the Berlin Museum shortly thereafter? World War II. World War II. So what happened to the finds in the museum then during World War II? They weren't destroyed, thank goodness. They were, some of them were hidden. Like the Amber Room? Like the Amber Room. Some of them, though, were taken when the Russians came into town. So you can imagine, as of World War II, um, we had lost the Trojan gold. So imagine our surprise as archaeologists, because you know, we've got a little finger in every pot when it comes to museums, right? We kind of keep a hold of these different threads. Imagine our surprise when in 1997, there was a new exhibit at this tiny museum just outside of Moscow called Trojan Gold. <laughs> we've requested to try to have it either sent to Berlin or ideally back to Troy. Not going to happen. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Um, we're not allowed to take photos. I have been lucky enough to see it, but there are no decent published photos that we've been able to find. Maybe this has changed. I haven't Googled it in two years. Don't quote me. Um, but um, we're not allowed to run any kind of analysis on it to fact check. So who knows? Maybe someone saw this picture of Sophia and said, ooh, that looks good. We'll look at some other Bronze Age stuff, make something similar. Um, but, but most of us who've had the chance to go and, and see the collection are pretty sure that definitely was what was originally in Berlin. Um, <gasps> according to whom? Priam was a myth. So it would have been, uh, so it was the gold that was collected over several different um, stratigraphic layers. Yeah, so it's just, it's a collection of the finds, gold finds. So it wasn't all in one collection together. It was scattered throughout different layers. So that's kind of the problem is we can't really figure out how much of that would have been originally part of Troy that we think of when we think about the Iliad and the Odyssey. That's a really good question. Um, and yeah, so it kind of it kind of stumps some of us. But what we can do at least is compare what we can see of the jewelry to other types of jewelry that we know from, say, like the Bronze Age. Yeah, good questions. Okay, are we ready to scoot along? All right, I'm going to continue to just to play with history. All right, so if you haven't done your homework before coming to our lecture today, um, let's see, can you guys see the cursor up here behind me or do you want me to jump up there? I can jump up there. You can see it okay? You can't see it? Okay, so I'll, I'll cursor and then I'll run up there and point. Okay, so here in the middle, when we talk about our different areas of the Bronze Age, we're dealing with the Cyclades, which are these islands just here. Oh, thank you. Oh, these are, yes, the cat toy. Okay, so we've got these islands just here in the middle using the cursor. These are called the Cyclades. Just there in the very middle, they're kind of our, our little guys. The reason we call them the Cyclades are because according to um, the wind and the currents, it's easiest to sail around them in a cyclical fashion. Cyclades. Okay, and then we've got the Greek mainland, which is... All through this area, we like to use the hand down here as kind of our, our guiding reference, all up along this way. So down here, all up here. Okay. And last, but certainly not least, and probably nearest and dearest to my heart down here, is Crete. Maybe second nearest. Uh, is Crete. It's the largest island. It is just north of Egypt. On a nice, clear day, standing on the southern coast, you can see straight to Egypt. It doesn't look like it should be that close, but it is. So, um, all right, 
we're going to do a quick and dirty how we talk about different time periods and locations because this is, is going to help if you if you decide to get more into a gene archaeology so when we're talking about chronology when we're talking about the way that we discuss time um, and different periods in the aegean we sort the bronze age into early middle and late and then that's sort of our first term and then our second term is where we are so Cycladic, Minoan, or Mycenaean. So for the Greek mainland, we just go with Mycenaean. So what we're going to talk about today is going to be early Cycladic. We're going to talk about one image that's kind of early Cycladic, very characteristic. And what I'm going to tell you will get you kicked out of the Met multiple times. So if you go to the Met in New York, do not say this out loud. They are now aware that people know this and they listen for it and they will boot you out. Um, then we will move over to like the middle Minoan period and we'll look at Crete. We will go back to Akrotiri. Where's my Akrotiri hand? Where did you go? Somebody was, you were asking about Akrotiri. We'll then go back to Akrotiri and we'll talk about um, one site in particular and a couple of wall paintings that give us some more insight into Bronze Age culture. And then we'll bounce over to the mainland and we'll kind of compare a little bit of architecture, a little bit of art. Um, and then depending on how much time is left, we're going to go crazy and you're going to tell me what you want to know and we're going to discuss things. Sound good? Okay, as we are on this journey together, I'm not kidding. Please raise your hand. I hate hearing myself talk. Anything that you want to know, stop me. Okay, so what we're going to start with then, early Cycladic, I promise you, these little guys, we have, oh gosh, the last time I checked, we have well over 1,400 known fragments of these guys. These are folded arm figurines. Um, they are unique to the islands for the most part. And uh, this is three views of the same little object. Have you guys ever seen these before? They got really big in like the 60s and 70s when they were first discovered. Um, and so I've, I mean, I've seen kind of knockoff versions of these in Mexican restaurants, very minimalist. People kind of like the way they look and they throw them around everywhere. Um, if you have the occasion to go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, go to the Getty, um, go to mm, almost any museum that features Bronze Age stuff, you are going to find some of these. And the tricky business with these is that most of them are fakes. <clears throat> yeah, I know. <laughs> Didn't think we were going to go there tonight, did you? <laughs> um, all right, so how do we tell a fake from an authentic folded arm figurine? These are really important because we tend to find them in burials um, in the islands. They are often, not always, but often located kind of horizontally along the head of the deceased. Um, but not always. Sometimes we find them broken into pieces, purposefully broken into pieces, and we'll find one on one island, one piece of a figurine on one island, and one piece of that same figurine on a different island. We don't know why yet. We haven't been able to figure it out because we're still wading through the fakes. Um, so we have, we have well over a thousand fakes. Um, of those, as of like 2017, I think, uh, we had identified 144 authentic pieces out of the more than 1,000. So the way that you tell an authentic folded arm figurine <coughs> is almost, well, every single time as far as we know, what, what do you notice? What do you see? How would you describe it? And we'll go from there. We'll build together. They have cone heads. Yeah, that's a really good way to put that. Their heads are kind of wedge shaped. Yep. So you can see the way here that the head is kind of tilted back a little bit, um, but definitely not round. So back here, that we're kind of tilted back. What else? What else do you see? Are they on their toes? They are on their toes. Wait, when do we? When do we do that with our feet? When we're dancing, so we could be dancing. Could They could be hopping. What if we're not vertical when we're relaxing our ankles? When we're sleeping, or when there's one more. Yeah, when you're dead. And we're finding them in some funerary contexts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're finding them in some funerary contacts. We're finding them in some burials. So maybe they have something to do with that. Um, several of these, we've been able to kind of do analysis on them, um, look at them under different kinds of light, and it turns out they were originally painted. So we have some of these figurines 
uh, would have red paint, three lines of red paint down their cheeks. I don't know what that means. Um, the one that everyone gets really excited about, we figured out there's one of them who was covered in eyeballs. Ooh, I know. Ooh. <laughs> Do, are any of you in mythology, Greek mythology? Oh, I see. I one hand real fast. It, if we talk about like a hundred eyes, does that evoke any recollection of a particular mythological figure for you? It's okay if it doesn't. It's a tricky one. Like, I have idea what we're going to talk about, but I forget the name of it. That's okay. <laughs> oh, it's not Medusa. You guys are you guys are getting close though. It's Argos. Argos is the guard dog for Hera. So it has all these eyes because Argos never sleeps. Is that related? We don't know. But that's the closest thing we could come up with. So there's there's this. So these little fellows, we really don't know what to do in terms of um, what they signify. Could they be mythological Are they references? Dated? Are they dated? Dated. Mostly to the early Cycladic period. So we're looking at like 3,000 up until maybe like 2,800. 2,700, yeah, it's, there's a really big range. Yeah, um, if you notice, uh, they're all also female. It's very subtle, you can see the subtle rounding of breasts, you can see a slightly more rounded belly, and some people have argued that because we don't have any phallus, this is definitely a female figure. That's pretty accepted in the literature. Um, you could go either way, maybe, it depends on, on what you think. So when we look at these, anytime that you see, what is it? It's always left over, left over right with their arms. Anytime that you see right over left, no. Anytime their feet are flat on the ground, no. We have some examples of these. The Metropolitan is, um, I hope they're not listening tonight. Um, the Metropolitan is uh, really well known for this one that's called the Lyre Player. And it's a figure sitting in a seat um, holding what looks like a lyre. Uh, but the figure is in a chair. It's not laying down flat. If you look at the back of the body here, that's pretty flat. Yeah, good observation. Back here. Gosh, that's so flat. Kind of something that would maybe suggest that they're made for laying down on their backs. Maybe. Um, yeah, so our early cycladic period is one where we have a lot of uh, there's a lot of movement. We know during the Neolithic period that comes just before, there are a lot of people who kind of come down from Turkey, from Anatolia, who move down through the Cyclades and eventually settle in Crete. We have some people go as far over, um, sorry, going this way with our map and our brains over to the mainland. Um, but it is, it's a period of mobility. It's a period of sort of expansion. And a lot of the settlements that we find are up in the mountains, away from the shoreline. What does that tell you? Could be pirates. Yeah, but it's a safe, defensible position, right? It's anyone be exhausted trying to literally run uphill to come to come after you. All right, um, let's step forward a little bit in time here. We're gonna move into the middle Minoan period. So if we're talking about the Minoan period, which island are we on? Crete, excellent. Yes, so we're on that biggest island down there. Uh, so we're on Crete, and this is um, this is the, a reconstruction of the palace at Knossos. Have you guys ever heard of the palace? Do you know anything about it? Some fellow named the W found it. Some fellow, uh, Sir Arthur Evans. Yeah, Sir Arthur Evans found it. Um, he came along maybe mm, 40 years after Schliemann, give or take. So he practiced much better archaeological pro process processes <coughs> when it comes to documentation. Um, so Sir Arthur Evans excavated almost the entire palace. Um, and if you ever, have any of you been to Crete yet? Some of, excellent, some of you. Okay, great, have you been to Knossos? Yeah? Yes, what do you guys remember, do you remember, like what do you remember about it? What was it like? Was it what you thought an archeological site would be like? It was, I mean, it was just, I mean, I was there within like 80, early, early. And it was, there were mosaics, that's what I remember. They had frescoes, yeah, like the paintings, yeah. 
Excellent. Yeah, they have. We have a lot of reconstructions. We know that there were um, a lot of frescoes, that, wall paintings that were originally located inside the structure. And so when they created, um, or maybe when they fine tuned the structure a little bit, um, a lot of this was actually done by Arthur Evans, was to put wall paintings in the structure so that we have this really interesting melding. It's kind of like Disneyland for archaeologists. Um, because if you go visit an archaeological site, usually you just kind of see the, the remains of things on the ground. No, when Sir Arthur Evans excavated, every time he had a stone removed from a wall to start to learn what was underneath it, he would mark where it was. And then they rebuilt Knossos and put cement between the stones so that it would never collapse and crumble, which is wonderful for archaeologists, except there are some things Arthur Evans unfortunately got wrong that are permanent now. <laughs> so when you get the chance to go visit Knossos, make sure you keep a skeptical eye, okay? What we have behind me here is, um, is an artist reconstruction of what we think the structure could have looked like. So you'll notice that we are surrounded by greenery. We're surrounded by hinterlands. Um, the structure itself I think at its highest, we're looking at six or seven stories tall. That's a lot. Not to mention that we also have rooms that are sunken into the ground. So altogether, we're dealing with closer to maybe eight stories. Um, do you guys remember anything, know anything about the Minoans? They were the bull dancers. The bull dancers, and we are going to get there. Okay, so um, in terms of what we're in terms of what we're seeing here, people call this a palace palace at Knossos. Um, the word palace is a misnomer because, you know, when you think of palaces, I mean, when I think of palaces, I think of dragons and princesses and moats and we don't, we don't do that here. We don't do the dragons and the, we maybe do princesses. Um, this is more like taking an entire downtown area and shoving it together with a central kind of courtyard in the middle. So you have administrative buildings, you have storage areas, you even have little shrines. Um, little religious areas. We have apartments. I mean, we haven't really quite figured out how to identify restaurants yet, but we do have some kitchens. Um, it really is. It is taking everything that is core to running an area and slamming it together. Um, we even have a throne room, believe it or not. Um, it's called the throne room because there's a chair in it. So if we were to look from the top down at the structure, does it remind you of anything? You might find on a children's menu at Bob Evans. A maze. Wait a minute. In terms of mythology, what do we know about mazes, dare we say labyrinths, and the island of Crete? We think the Minotaur. Bingo! And this one's a little bit trickier. Do you remember who it was that took the Minotaur out? Alessia. Theseus, excellent. Yeah, people always say Perseus. I don't know. I think it must be a beheading or something. Here yeah. <laughs> so, so in in short, the story with um, with Theseus and the Minotaur is is essentially there are seven youths that are taken to Crete that have to be fed to the Minotaur under the threat that King Minos would otherwise somehow transport the Minotaur, a human eating, flesh eating, terrible monster. Um, over to the mainland, over to Mycenae or to Athens, and just set it loose and let it rampage. So instead of having to deal with any of that, nope, we just send over our, um, our Athenian youth and feed the Minotaur as our tax. Um, so Theseus, the, the prince, decides this is not okay. So instead of being exempt from the lottery, uh, his father begs him not to, but eventually he throws his own name into the lottery, gets chosen otherwise we're not a hero, um, and gets whisked away to the island of Crete. Now, as you can imagine, when people are being taken uh, to be future sacrifices, usually they're, I mean, ideally, they're not thrilled. Um, so when they're removed from the ship, we anticipate they would probably be stripped of weapons, things like this, right? There would be people there to handle them and take them to the temporary holding dungeons. Now, at some point, between arriving and being put in the dungeon, like every good Disney movie, Theseus makes eyes at Ariadne. Who's Ariadne? Well, if it's a Disney princess. movie, she better be a princess. Yeah, she's the princess of Crete, so she's King Nino's daughter. So they're making eyes at each other, they fall in love. No words, love. 
So uh, it, once, once he's stuck down there and he's, he's hidden away in the prison and night falls and she runs down there and she says, listen, Bob, I've got string. I've got your sword. Take these, but you got to get me the heck off of this island. And he's like, that's a deal. And she's like, can we get married? He's like, sure. Um, so she gives him this. Somehow the guard doesn't see it the next morning when they're taken in there to be fed to the Minotaur. You know the rest of the story, right? Theseus runs in there, does the thing with the Minotaur, retraces his steps out with this yarn, grabs Ariadne, jumps on his ship, and sails home. And they live happily ever after. How many Greek myths end with happily ever after? <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely none of them. So instead, actually, what happens is once they're on the ship, Theseus is kind of like, you know, I don't really like you that much. <laughs> so he kicks her overboard when they're just kind of passing by the island of Naxos. It's the biggest of the Cycladic islands there in the middle. And says, good luck, toots. And he heads the rest of the way back home. I mean, and then more tragedy ensues. Don't worry about her, though, because Dionysus happens to be flying over. Who is, I mean, if you have to marry a god, he's not a bad god to marry out of partying and all that. So he comes down, he marries her, and she's fine. She's taken care of for the rest of her days. Um, I mean, not exactly a happy ending, but there you have it. So it's this myth that we think later classical cultures, maybe maybe during the archaic period, maybe during one of the in-between periods, maybe they come back to Crete, long after the fall of our Bronze Age, take one look at these remains and go, oh my gosh, there is a monster here. What kind of monster? The kind that's got bull something about them. Because we find all of this bull imagery. Not just bulls, we get other animals too. Minoans love their art. They love their animals. And I'm not saying we're full on hippy dippy flower children here. Like we're not we're not going quite that far. But Minoans love painting their animals. And their style, their artistic style really emphasizes exactly what they want you to notice about these animals. So if you look closely at the bull that's depicted up here now, I'm gonna give you a, a key here for how we look at them. The bull and all of the fragments that are a little bit, mm, I don't know, chunkier, a little bit darker than what we have in the background. All of these are original, but a lot of this nice smooth area, that's all reconstruction. So really what we have of this image um, is enough to inform the reconstruction, but we, we're still missing kind of a lot of information from the surrounding background. Um, we try to fill it in based on what we know of other images in Aegean art. Um, so, so walk me through this one. What do you guys see? And feel free to just jump in. I'll give you a hint. There's a bowl in the middle. <laughs> jumping over the bowl. Yeah, so we've got... Good, yeah, so we've got somebody here in the middle that is dancing. Well, is catching it. Catching, okay, so we have what, what you're reading as like a catching pose in the back. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've got our, our somebody catching, we've got somebody dancing, question mark, somebody maybe leaping, um, acro acrobaticize it, acrobatting. Um, someone acrobatically engaged with the bull. Um, and then what's this figure doing up here? Holding the bull's horns and getting ready to jump, I think. Taking the bull by the horns, right? Oh, yeah, I know. Some of these are a little bit tricky. Um, so, have any of you, do, do any of you work with livestock? Have you ever worked with livestock, worked on a dairy farm, or anything like that? I mean, sorry? Chickens. Chickens. Um, <laughs> I think you'd have to have a pretty big flock of chickens to be for them to be able to pull you like these guys. Um, so, so what we're seeing here, we know is something special, right? We probably can't do this every day, but we're not we're not quite sure what to do with this image, even still. I know. I wish I had a bunch of answers for you guys today. Yes, this is. We see it's a very specific fertility ritual. I'm going to give you a hint. 90% of the things that we call fertility rituals are completely incorrect. So if you ever hear somebody say, oh, that's fertility. No, it's not. That just means there's a woman in the image. <sighs> I know. Um, we, uh, in, in most of my classes, when, we're, when we talk about ancient art, we, we call fertility the F word, and we just don't curse in class. So... Um, <laughs> Some of them love it, some of them don't. Um, so what we're seeing here, so we have, if you notice, we have individuals that have different colored skin. 
That's interesting. So are we looking at different nationalities? Are we looking at different populations? Are we looking at, oof, a lot of people have drawn connections between Minoan art and what's happening in Egypt. And in Egypt, when you have males depicted, they're depicted with dark brown, dark red skin because they're the ones who go outside. They have public lives. They engage with more people outside of the home, outside of the sunshine. Women tend to be depicted with white skin because they stay in the house. We don't go outside. We are fair, if you will. Um, and so a lot of people like to draw this sort of comparison and they say, okay, well, if that's the case, we've got two women on either side of the bowl and a man jumping over the top of the bowl. That was put forth maybe in the, what, 1920s, 30s, um, and there was uproar. Why do you think people were not buying this in the 20s and 30s? 20s and 30s? Who's going to put their lady in harm's way? I, know, I see some of the women here going, oh. <laughs> yeah. Furthermore, what if we're wrong about this idea that white skin represents female and brown skin represents male? If this is the case, then we have something, we have something else that we got to kind of examine here. Um, we do have preserved fragments that show the clothing that these folks are wearing. Walk me through how we decode clothing. Do men and women wear the same thing? Not always. In this culture? We're not sure. Because I will, uh, well, it depends on how I answer, because it, if you want to talk about ornamental in terms of appear in almost all of the art, yes. Very rarely are men represented clearly in the art. But we have some miniature paintings. Oh yeah, we, yeah, we'll stick some guys in the miniature paintings. Um, we have maybe a couple of large wall paintings. Maybe a few, I'll, I'll say a few, that's nicer. Um, a few wall paintings where we, where we see men, but the majority are women. Interesting, right? Because if you want to depict power, if you want to advertise to the people who come and visit your island, how your island works, who's in charge. I mean, let's think maybe of Washington, D.C., right? Knossos is maybe like the Washington, D.C. Of, of Crete. Well, we got the Lincoln Monument for crying out loud, right? A big guy, he's in charge. So we got the art that shows him. But here, if these are indeed women on either side of our bull leaper, we really have to reconsider how we think about culture, how we think about hmm, who engages in what activities and what they wear. Because here, all three of them are wearing loincloths. Which, you know, to our early, early 1900s sensibilities is maybe not so desirable. Definitely don't want to let that out. Hit me. Do they know the gender of the person who painted? We don't. That is such a good question. I specialize prim primarily, primarily in the wall paintings and the technologies that we have for plasters. And well, it could, so if we know, if we were able to decode something like this, it would, it might help inform the imagery unless we're dealing with, um, you guys are kind of familiar with the, the Renaissance, right? How like the art, artists work, how our workshops work. Someone is commissions a piece of artwork, says, hey, I want you to, I don't know, paint a picture of me, but make me look like the Virgin Mary, but not too much. And the artist says, oh, okay, well, I can do it like this. I can do it like that. So do we have something like that happening here? We don't know. Um, the traditional, and I say <sighs> traditional because feel like using that terminology makes it very clear that there are way too many ways we can pick this apart. Um, the traditional interpretation of artistic workshops um, is that it is exactly the same as what we see during the Renaissance, but without the star power, without the sort of celebrity status of the artist. So we, as far as we know, we don't have any Michelangelo of the Bronze Age. Um, but what is interesting is that the material that they use for these wall paintings Lime plaster, especially during this period, the lime plaster, um, is used not just for art, but they use it for everything that is any kind of special. So there are entire rooms that are just covered in lime plaster and they're just left white, which is really unusual for a lot of other cultures. If you're going to use something like lime plaster, that's a more expensive material. It takes a lot of processing. There's a lot of nuanced technology that you really have to nail to get it right. Um, why would you not? painted as well. 
we're still trying to figure this out. And in some of these rooms where it's just white, you can see where whoever it was who is plastering the area, sometimes with a nice tool, kind of like a little float that'll level things out. If you want to think of maybe about drywall or something like that. Um, sometimes just with their bare hands. And this is where I get excited because we have all kinds of theories about, okay, well, how large people were, then we can maybe extrapolate about how large their hands were. And if we can figure out about how large their hands were, and if we have a nice handprint or just here from the edge of your hand, you know, if you're smoothing something out, sometimes we'll get that impression of the heel of the hand. And there are theories about, and I have mixed feelings about these, um, the swirls that are in your fingertips and kind of across your hand, you know, that the patterning, I'm sure there's a technical term for this that I'm not remembering right now. Um, the, the sort of ridges supposedly are spaced differently on male hands and female hands. So if this is the case, and if we get enough examples of these, maybe we can figure something like this out, but we're just not there yet. Do you have any opinion about Mary Renaud's novel, King Must Die? No, I, do, I have not read it. What is this? It's a novel about bull dancing. Is it? Theseus is the main character. Oh, I have to get my hands on it then. Okay, afterwards, I want to pick your brain, if that's okay. Sure. Don't, don't run away right when we're done. Yes? That's a good question. So this is the original fragment that has the blue background behind them. But I like that you're thinking of matadors because in Spain today, people bull leap. They do. They jump over bulls. Crazy, right? Yeah. So if you guys want to know more about this, I'm always happy to, to field questions or send you articles. Um, keeping an eye on the time here, I want to make sure at least we get to Akrotiri if we don't quite make it to the mainland. So some of the other imagery, and this comes from a much later period, some of the other imagery that we get about bulls is we get bull leaping and sometimes we see wild bulls. This is really the only image we get where we have bull sacrifice. And it comes from uh, really after the eruption of Akrotiri, this is almost the very end of the Bronze Age. So I'm skipping a little bit ahead here. But you can see the bull and the little X over his tummy is where he's being, he's tied up and he's being held on the table. Um, and then you can see these poor, terrified little goats just under the table who are next. Oh, man. But it's a very particular scene. And what's interesting is that we don't see the moment of sacrifice. Nowhere, as far as I know, I need to quantify it or qualify it. Um, as far as I know, we don't have any clear depictions of the moment of sacrifice in Aegean art especially not in the islands, maybe somewhere on the mainland, but in the islands, no, we don't do that. We can kind of allude to it. So some of the other things that we see happening up here that are very quintessentially um, Minoan, um, we have something that looks maybe like a shrine here. We have these horns of consecration. So our shrine. And then up top, these little horns with a tree sprouting from the very middle. Um, sort of set back just a bit here. Uh, we have what we think, who we think is a priestess, maybe. Um, and she's doing something at maybe an altar or at a smaller shrine next to some double axes. I know they're a little bit tricky to pick out, especially because we're dealing with a little bit of fuzziness. Um, a bowl of maybe fruit, something like that floating up here to show you maybe what she's doing or clarify something about what's going on. And then we have some musicians in the background. So here we have a young man playing the double flute. And um, another, we think maybe a female person, because if you look down here, the little feet are white and not red. Um, sort of processing that's going to participate in the, the event that we see here. So that image is from what we call the Aya Triata sarcophagus. Aya Triata is the site where it's found. Uh, the sarcophagus itself is, is an actual sarcophagus. Um, this is my favorite word in the English language, <laughs> sarcophagus. When we translate the pieces of this word, it literally means flesh eater. Oh, you can't tell me that's not beautiful. Because what originally happened was um, beneath the sarcophagus here, underneath this uh, the sort of the, the bottom panel, there'd be holes drilled up in there so that once the deceased is, the deceased is interred inside of the sarcophagus, um, you, you leave it and decomp and the gooey, the gooey parts are gone, and then all you have left are the bones. And people in the Aegean 
in many, many contexts, most island contexts, practice secondary burial. So there would be a period of burial, maybe in a sarcophagus like this, and then people would go back later and collect all of the bones, some of the bones, and relocate them to a secondary burial location, a kind of ossuary, if you want to think maybe about the catacombs in Paris, something really similar. So we see all different, all different types of treatment there. But what's interesting is we've never found, well, almost never find, um, really nicely plastered sarcophagi because they do the dirty work. So it's not really until the end where we start seeing more of an emphasis on death and decorating burial items, which might tell us a little something about the changing interests or the changing thoughts of these island people. The image from the other side, so this is just zooming in a little bit here so you can see better, is something else that we argue about. We argue about everything, everything. Um, so here we have who might be the same young priestess, young woman, dumping something into another vessel, and then we have little red squiggles coming out down here. So could it be blood? Could it be, I mean, we all think it's blood. Could it be wine? Could be wine. Wine's a valuable offering as well. Um, and here you can clearly see these double axes, right, that are up here, nice and set up. Um, we have another female individual here carrying two vessels, and then another musician, and then three men processing toward the right, toward someone wearing a cloak or a blanket, maybe, um, who's standing out in front of what looks like it could be a shrine. Some people want to argue this is the deceased standing in front of their tomb. Ah, but we don't know. So most people go, that's cool, moving on. That's where you know you can look and find more information. So some of us are looking, myself included, some of us are looking at um, contemporary and earlier representations of death and burial in Mesopotamia. And I'll let you know, we find their death gods standing in doorways that look just like this one. Oh, I know that's good. That's a topic for another night. Also not next week. Um, so on the, on the side of the sarcophagus, we see what we think are goddesses in a chariot led by griffins. And I know the griffins are a little tricky to see here. So here are the wings. And they have crests on top of their heads. And they're pulling chariots, which really aren't known until the end of the Bronze Age, um, because we think the technology is introduced by groups that are from much farther east, who are already using these types of, of battle tactics. Um, the sarcophagus itself, so the sub-layer is made completely out of stone, and then it's coated in lime plaster, and it's painted, the lime plaster is painted while it's still wet with wet pigment. So it's, it's a, the pigment becomes part of that lime plaster layer as opposed to just kind of floating on top, which is why it looks so good. The preservation is outstanding. Bingo. Bingo. And a lot of the stuff that we have, a lot of the stuff I'm showing you guys tonight, we think really just does come from elite burials. And I throw up quotation marks because we don't know for sure. We think we've maybe, maybe excavated six to seven percent of the sites that we've found. So that that is a sliver of what their world was actually like. Um, but it's it's kind of irresponsible to just keep digging to find more cool stuff without publishing, coming out talking to people, um, and letting you guys know what what we've found while we've been working. So unfortunately, we can't keep digging yet. We have to publish. Um, all right. Where are we on time? We got 10 minutes for Akrotiri. How are you guys feeling? Good? All right. So if you haven't, haven't heard of Akrotiri before, um, this, this eruption at Akrotiri um, is an epic geological event. It's not just catastrophic. It is a disastrophe. I couldn't think of any bigger word than combining disaster and catastrophe. It is huge. Um, we find evidence of this volcanic eruption in the form of ash from the Aegean in either of the polar ice caps. This was huge. I cannot overstate this. Um, let's see, how, how far down the rabbit hole do we go tonight? So originally, there are a couple of different theories, but most of us are in large agreement that the island you see there in the very middle, 
there was always sort of a, an island in the middle and a little collection, like a little lake around it. Otherwise, most of the rest of the island over here was filled in. This eruption made a crater in the middle. We think that there were probably several sites that were located along that inner rim because of the shelter from the rest of the elements from the, that would come in from the exterior of the island. It would have been a great place to be a little marketplace. I mean, can you imagine? Do any of you watch The Lord of the Rings, uh, the new show that's on Amazon? They have that beautiful, like, ocean town. I'm, I'm a terrible TV watcher, so I can't remember, can't remember all the nuances. Um, but it, it just glitters, and everyone's in awe, and it's so over the top. And that's, we think that's a similar impression that people would get when they're coming to Akrotiri, or at least when they're coming to some of these interior sites of which we no longer have evidence. Why do we think this? Because the site that we do have down here at, at Akrotiri um, on the island of Santorini is so rich is an understatement. How, ma how many of you know about what happened at Pompeii, right? We have the, the volcanic eruption. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm getting knots. Thank goodness. Um, save us some time, right? So we have the volcanic eruption. It's literally called the Pompeii effect when that ash falls preserves things, some things, like architecture, inorganic materials, and things that won't decompose quickly. But things that are organic and that do decompose quickly left behind voids in that surrounding ash structure that we can then fill in with plaster to then learn what that shape was. Um, we can do the same thing at Akrotiri, except the wonderful part of Akrotiri is we have yet to find any remains of humans. There are no voids of humans. Whatever happened here um, in the days leading up to that final eruption, all of the people knew to get out. And so a lot of the finds that we have show us that they took all, all of their valuable belongings with them, anything they could carry. So far, we found a sickly pig or evidence of a sickly pig. We don't find dogs. We don't find sheep. We don't find uh, nothing like that. What we do find are voids left behind by end tables and by beds. We know what their beds look like. And why is this so cool? Because the beds were made out of organic material and every other site in the Bronze Age, the only way we would otherwise know what their beds look like is if they painted it on something that still survives. We have the dimensions <coughs> of their beds. We could build reconstructions of their beds. Some of the casts that we have of end tables look like you could go to maybe somewhere nicer than Ikea and, and buy it. They're gorgeous. So the reason why I'm showing you this now is because the architecture is so well preserved here. And the architecture is key because the architecture allows us to preserve the wall paintings. I mean, architecture is cool. I don't really like architecture. Um, it's not my wheelhouse, um, ironically enough. But the, the architecture is beautiful. So we have staircases that are still intact. Um, the the uh, last I checked, the largest uh, structure that we still have has three stories preserved. That's and I'm not counting the basement. I'm just saying above. That's brilliant. And all of this was excavated over mm, ten to fifteen years in the 1960s and early 70s. We haven't been able to resume excavations at Akrotiri because we still haven't published all of the <coughs> material that we have. We're still studying it. So some of the really cool things we have, this is probably the most famous wall painting. Um, and I will walk you through how to read it. I know it's a lot if you've never seen it before. So bear with me, here we go. We have a young girl with a very close cut haircut and like a teeny weeny little ponytail in the back, just here. And she's dumping out a basket into another basket. And these are all crocus flowers. What valuable spice comes from the crocus flowers? Saffron. Do we know anything else about saffron? It is so expensive. I told my husband to go buy me some just to see if he would. <laughs> and he got to the grocery store because he never goes grocery shopping. He got to the grocery store and he called me and he said, babe, are you sure we need this? <laughs> no, of course not. Um, but I had him take a photo of the, the price for me at the time and we were, we were over $35,000 for a pound of saffron in December, this past December. How wild is that? So we have an, a real emphasis here on not just the crocus flowers, but um, here 
this blue monkey who's standing on back legs. I promise it's a monkey. We have a tail right here. Blue monkey standing upright on two legs is offering a pinch of saffron to the seated, we call her a goddess, but fight with me. Here, we call her a goddess because she is so big compared to the young girl. If she were to stand up, her head would blast through those upper borders. So we have this idea, hierarchy of scales, what we call it, so people who are represented as larger in art probably have more power. Um, so we think she's a goddess, we're not sure, but we think. Um, and so she's seated on this really nice cushion. And in if you when you have the chance to go see this in person, um, the cushion is, is a very rich yellow with red trim which might make you think of saffron that colors things yellow, but comes from a little red stamen. Um, and then behind her, this is my favorite part, after the monkey, we have a griffin. And I know it's not well-preserved. You can mostly see the wings. And here's the little head. And then back here, can you kind of see that red line? It's leashed. Ooh. The leash disappears over to a pretty nice straight line over here that's that's a window frame so we have the griffin leashed to the window frame behind the seated goddess how cool is this we have no idea what to do with it <laughs> we we have some theories um so some of us think okay well saffron saffron is like a medicinal herb so um so maybe it's a whole scene about healing and rejuvenation and okay well that that would be great except um well I, I was Googling lately, you know, when you're, when you can't sleep and you have to look something up online or you're reading your book or something, somehow you come across a random little tidbit of information and you go, oh, I have to rethink my whole life now. <laughs> um, this was one of those moments. I was reading an, an article, a recently published article that was supposed to be about all of the healing effects of saffron. Um, and it turns out if you have more than two tables, or, sorry, teaspoons, more than two teaspoons of saffron, it can induce symptoms of poisoning. That sounds like a dangerous herb to put on a wall painting, doesn't it? I don't know. So this is something that we're working on. This is something that has not yet been published. Maybe I'll be invited back in the future <laughs> after it's been published. Um, so that we, we start, maybe, maybe it's not right to think of her as maybe a healing entity, but maybe we should think of her as someone who you don't want to make angry or someone that you have to treat just right to get the desired result. Um, so yeah, so this is this is an example of really well-preserved wall paintings, and that's the one that most of us are obsessed with. Um, I, on the other hand, have completely lost my mind, and in, 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 and I am in complete love with monkeys. Go bananas, right? So um, we have we have a room. This is one of the walls in our room. Oh no, I'm almost out of time. How far over time? Can I go like two more minutes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I love about these monkeys is that these these are traditionally considered to be vervets that come out of Egypt. Um, you know, Egypt's the closest place that have has monkeys. The Aegean Islands, we don't do monkeys. We don't have monkeys indigenously. They don't live here. We've never found remains. Someone got really excited. God love them. No one else does. He got really excited. He found what he thought was a monkey skull and he told everyone and it was widely publicized. And then his sister, who's a primatologist, took one look at it and said, you found a rock. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bad day. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, we don't actually have any, any physical remains, any bones, any other physical indications that monkeys were present on these islands. But what we do have is art like this, this wall painting in particular, um, that shows that Aegean people, the, the artists, at some point saw these monkeys because they are rendered with such precision that primatologists today are still in a screaming match over exactly which species it is. We have two camps. So the first camp says, well, Egypt's the closest place that has monkeys, and Occam's razor probably the right answer because, you know, it's, it's close and they've got them and their monkeys look kind of close, um, except it's a very traditional argument and the, the argument is actually not put forward by primatologists. It's, it's been put forward by our historians and archaeologists and we don't study monkeys. So uh, another one of us, 
got together a team of primatologists and a taxonomic illustrator. So the guy who makes the scientific drawings for, you know, I don't like the Audubon Society with all their birds, like they had taxonomic illustrators do that. So I figure, you know, he'll, he'll know to look for the artistic stuff. Um, so we got our team together and I made sure I sent them all of these images. There were tons of images from Mesopotamia, from Egypt, from all over the Aegean of monkeys. And I said, okay, can you identify anything? Do you have any ideas about anything? And separately, I told them not to talk to each other. So if the joke is on me and they did, well, I fell for it and everyone else is about to. Um, but every single one of them said, ah, you know, it really looks like those could be Hanuman Langers. Hanuman. But there's no way. I can't be, I can't, I can't be understanding what they're saying. Langers come from areas of Bhutan, Nepal, and India. And what we're looking at here is a wall painting that was created by at least 1550 BCE. 1550. Now, traditionally, we like to think the Silk Roads opened up just before the Renaissance, right? So we're looking at 1100, 1200, 1550 BCE. And this, isn't, this is not all there is. I'm going to have to end here because I don't want to keep you over for the rest of your lives where you'd never get out of here. Uh, but in a nutshell, we have more evidence. And there was Afro-Eurasian trade. We have ginger. We have rice. We have bananas that come from Southeast Asia. We've got soy. All kinds of things that are moving, not just animals. Feeds, you name it. And I will finish this up very quickly, maybe, in the next lecture, and then we'll move on and we'll do the archaic and classical periods, I promise. Thank you guys so much for your questions and for being so engaged. Yes. Oh boy, you better come up here because uh, we'll keep you here all night. We do think, we do think that they were um, pets of some kind. We also have... Um, if we're going to look at Mesopotamia for, for a quick second, because, you know, they're in the middle. Mesopotamia is the perfect through fare, whether we're talking maritime or overland trade. So in Mesopotamia, when we look at monkeys, they're grouped together in descriptions um, with other animals like uh, Curse of Agate. Curse of Agate is a great example of a hymn to Inanna, this goddess, who's one of my favorites. Um, and they lump monkeys together with water buffalo and elephants which we know were imported not from Egypt, but from the Indus. And so it's interesting because we get these like clusters of animals that are mentioned together. In Mesopotamia, we have menageries. Really rich people would import monkeys. They always requested she monkeys because male monkeys, see, you've got me stuck here. I know, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's um, they, would, they didn't want male monkeys, especially not baboons. The Egyptian word for, for baboon is the same word they use for rage. <gasps> you know, so so we don't want these scary male baboons. God, no. Just give us the, the lady baboons because they're nice and they're docile. And all we really need is one boy baboon to have a lot of little baby baboons that will make us look much more rich now that we have this menagerie in our front yards. Genius and terrifying. Yeah. Okay, go home. God, go home. <laughs> <laughs>